So um, for those of you who have been following along and have been here, um, we've been going through the book of Mark, and uh, we're continuing our series in the book of Mark today, where we, uh, we come to a very interesting passage. And uh, you see, Jesus had just disrupted the, the temple process when he had entered Jerusalem, and we talked about this last week a little bit, but just to, to cap it, to, to provide context for today's message, he had just disrupted the temple process by overturning the money tables, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the priesthood, um, as a result of everything that Jesus had been speaking about, and, and this act of, of, of saying, this, is, this place is not what God has intended it to be, turning over the money tables. The Pharisees, Herodians, and Sadducees had it out for Jesus. They, they had it out for him before what he did in the temple, but especially now. Jesus, you see, he threatened the status quo of the entire Jewish religious system. And because um, public opinion had been in Jesus' favor, now, they, they couldn't lay hands on, on the Lord for fear of what the crowds would do because, as you remember, Palm Sunday was just before what I'm going to be speaking. So they were crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Son of David, you know, is coming into the, into the city of Jerusalem. So they had to, de- to contend with this. So the, uh, the religious leaders, they, they decided to try a different tactic they tried to discredit Jesus. They used this by, they did this by using trick questions in attempt to divide the people over issues that Jesus would take a stand on. And their objective was to get them disagreeing and fighting with one another so that the ministry of Jesus would fizzle out. Religious leaders of Israel joined together to try and turn the people against the Lord in what they perceived that he was trying to accomplish. Our text today is in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 27. Mark 12, 13 to 27. You can follow along with us here in the overhead or there's Bibles in the pew or if you've got your own Bible, that's great. So reading from verse 13, we'll just start with verse 13. Later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Now, what's really interesting about this scenario in verse 13 here is, if you don't know much about the history of Jewish religion of that day, most of us maybe aren't that familiar with it, The school of Pharisees and the school of Herodians, they had very different approaches to their religion. The two didn't go well together. As a matter of fact, they were so different from one another, they were rivals. And oftentimes they would express their hatred for one another's thinking. Normally they they wouldn't be on speaking terms. Normally, they're at odds, even to the point of uh, physical violence sometimes would break out over religious discussions where they had difference. And yet here we see, when it comes to Jesus, they come together, they hold counsel together as enemies of the truth. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we hear Jesus speak, We hear the truth coming from his lips. The living word of God speaks the truth. So we see these religious groups coming together, even though they're polar opposites in their understanding, on a common enemy, which is the truth that Jesus is proclaiming. Now the Pharisees, let's focus on them for a second, they formed a very strict party of the law in Judea. And the Pharisees rejected and despised all Roman rule and authority. And yet they cooperated with the Romans in order to preserve their own positions in Israel with hopes that sooner or later they're going to have an opportunity. 
going to have an opportunity to throw off the bonds of Rome. The Pharisees saw cooperation with the Romans as just this temporary thing, and they had a very strong expectation that there would soon be a Messiah who would come onto the scene, a Messiah king who would save Israel from its enemies and restore the physical kingdom of David back to its original glory. They believed themselves to be the heralds of this and the catalyst that would bring about all of this under the will of God. The Pharisees considered the Herod clan to be evil usurpers of the throne of David. Traditionally, they didn't like these Herodians, these Herod supporters. Very important for us to understand this. Now, the Herodians, on the other hand, they also sought um, the good of Israel from their own perspective. But their hope was completely based on the house of Herod. And Herod was not, in fact, a Jew. He was actually an Edomite. King Herod, the great, had converted to the Jewish faith, and he was related to Israel. So... uh, He had to be better than the hated Romans. So they threw their their, uh, support behind him. And Herod, wanting to be be in the good books with the people, he was a great architect, for for those of you who didn't know. Like Herod the Great built great architecture. He was known all all over the ancient world for great architecture. And Herod actually poured funds into the second temple that was built in Nehemiah's time, the second temple after the first had been destroyed, Herod poured lavish decor and carvings of stone and all this kind of stuff into the the temple. So the Herodians were, were pleased with this. And they were dedicated to keeping Herod and his sons on the throne. Now, most of the Herodians were Sadducees and and priests, scribes and and Sadducees. Um, The the party of Pharisees was much smaller. But anyways, the, the Pharisees and Herodians, being at odds with one another, had this common cause to fight. They both opposed Jesus and wanted to destroy him so that their cause would be elevated. The Pharisees wanted the Messiah after their own taste. The Herodians, they actually didn't see the need for a Messiah. They were pretty comfortable with the temple system, how it was operating. And the religious factions had their ideals and plans secured in Israel, but Jesus' approach did not fit any of them. To realize their own plans, the one religious faction sometimes used the other, but neither faction desired to see this Jesus of Nazareth rise to prominence because he was a threat to the status quo. In the minds of the Pharisee and the Herodian, Jesus, he needed to be removed. So using a clever question, this unholy alliance, they they got together and they discussed a question and they put it to Jesus. We continue reading in our text in verse 14. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And here's the catch. Here's the trick. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Wow. The background to this trap that they were setting here, they were schmoozing Jesus. They were, it was, it was just, you could hear the hiss of, of the serpent in the background. It was very smooth. It was done very calculated. Now, as a backdrop, this tax had caused major uprisings in the not-too-distant past. You see, you guys remember the birth of Jesus? Where Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem to register in a census? See, the reason why the census was done was that The Romans wanted to put a head tax on every single Jew, and they wanted to know who was who in the zoo. So they did this. So while Quirinius was governor of the then-known Syria, or 
the uh, Roman Empire in that area. When Jesus was born in 6 AD, this is all over the history books, this is true. Um, there was this census that occurred for the purposes of taxation. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, at the same time, you see, as a backdrop to all of this question that's being asked, there was a certain man named Judas of Galilee. And he was in league with Zadok the Pharisee. And these two guys said, uh, uh, uh. Rome wants to tax us. But we don't think that anyone should pay this tax to Rome. After all, um, God is our king and Caesar is not. So they actually had an armed uprising in, at the time of the birth of Christ where they tried to rally the people of Israel to rebel against Caesar and his authority over them, telling them to refuse to pay the tax. And even they went so far as to go to villages, and when they found people that were willing to pay the tax, they would actually burn their houses down and steal their livestock. Ultimately, however, um, Judas the Galilean fell into uh, trouble with the government, of course, and also with Herod. <laughs> Interesting. Even though Herod was kind of not the supporter of the Pharisees, really, he kind of did his own thing. He was more with the Sadducees and the scribes. Herod had Judas the Galilean arrested and he was executed. So it's unusual that the Pharisees and the Herodians were working together. And in this scenario, to the Pharisee, Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that they were looking for. He was a man of peace, a man who spoke up against uprising and violence. He was not aggressive enough for their taste. Well, Jesus was also unpopular with Herodians because of what he had done. I mentioned what he had done in the temple. They were... They had the temple set up in such a way that they were overcharging the people that were coming to bring sacrifices to sacrifice to the Lord. They were, uh, they were, uh, they were upset because Jesus condemned that, overturned the money tables, drove them out, called them a bunch of robbers, and told them that they turned the place of prayer that God had set aside in the temple for the Gentiles into this marketplace den of robbers. So this question was loaded. The Pharisees and the Herodian both hoped to ensnare Jesus in a catch-22. Everyone knows what a catch-22 is, right? No matter what you do, you can't answer it right. Someone's going to be mad. Some, there's going to be disturbance. So, if Jesus said that the Jews should pay taxes to Rome, this would make them unpopular. This tax was not popular with the Jewish people. And the Pharisees, they knew it. And they, 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 they picked this question. They wanted people to think if he said, yeah, you pay taxes to Rome, what kind of weak-kneed Messiah is this anyways? I thought the Messiah was supposed to be restoring the kingdom back to Israel in power to save us from these Roman dogs. That's on the other hand, if he said the, the Jews shouldn't pay taxes to Rome, it would be put on him to be on the bad side of Herod and the Roman government. The Herodians, after all, had Judas, the Galilean, executed. The Herodians were hoping that Jesus of Nazareth would suffer the same fate as him because he threatened their lifestyle. So we continue reading in te our text in verse 15. Should we pay or shouldn't we? That's what they asked Jesus. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and that, let me look at it. Denarius, Roman coin. So Jesus could clearly see this trap coming and they were trying to lead him into it. So they brought a coin, brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said them to them, 
Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed with him. What an answer. So Jesus diffused this whole attack to try and turn the people against him. And in practical application, see these Herodians had aspirations. They, they wanted to make their control, dig in their control over the religious systems that were in place. The rhythm the Herodians had was, was a great rhythm. Their content on having their religious services in the temple cater to them in their own traditional ways. Rather than worshiping God in spirit and truth, it was all about form to them. They were worshiping God because it fit their lifestyle and it provided them with a blessing of a good income and comfort and respect from the people. They wanted things to operate the same way. They didn't, they just wanted it so. They wanted it so. They didn't want their religious boat being rocked by this Nazarene. Jesus confronted their systems of religions. He suggested that their religious traditions were being passed off as holy, but were in fact not. They were being exclusive, caring nothing for those who were outside of Israel. Instead, they pushed Gentiles out of the place of prayer for all nations. They turned this temple into a marketplace. See, the temple tax ensured the leaders were able to have comfortable, luxurious lives. Herod's temple was like a well-oiled machine. But what did Jesus say? This was all tied together with the miracle of the cursed fig tree that we talked about. Jesus said that they were like a fig tree full leaf that should be bearing fruit, but was in fact barren of any good fruit of righteousness. Because everything they pursued in their religion was not of the Spirit of God. It was of the flesh. It was driven by the aspirations of man. If we equate this to the modern age, there's plenty of religious services taking place all across this nation right now, all over North America, all over the world. I have a question for all of you. If Jesus was to come in person and attend one of our worship services on a Sunday morning, would he be pleased? In many cases, I can confidently say, yes, he would. He would be pleased. But unfortunately, in many, many cases, I... I think that he would be grieved. It's good for us to ask this question, my friends. What are we coming here for? Why are we gathering together on our Sunday mornings? It's good for us to ask ourselves that question. Why are we having religious services in the first place? Maybe some of us, and I'm not saying who, because God knows everyone's hearts, but maybe some of us need to reevaluate why we come to church. Have we bought in with the philosophy of the Herodians who are comfortable in our established religious system where everything is just so, the sound is just so, the sermon is just so. The setting is just so. The time is just so. Everything is just so. Does our reason for coming have much to do of tra about tradition, which brings us a measure of comfort and routine? We have to ask ourselves an important question here, too. Do we place more weight? Do we place more weight on personally pleasing traditions which make us comfortable, which tickle us, 
which make us feel warm and fuzzy. Or seeing people from outside of our circles come to know God. Do we place great value in prayer, seeking God to break through and minister to the needs of others who are without Him? Or others who are struggling in their walk with Him? Or is our programming exclusive and self-focused, created for the sake of personal satisfaction and meeting personal needs? God calls us as a church, universal, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Everything we are has to be focused on the mission of the Savior. It's not only preaching the gospel, but as I mentioned with the children this morning, it's go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Making disciples. That is the focus. But that's not the focus of the Herodians. The Herodians are all about me, myself, and I, and how I can get what I can get out of this deal. I'm asking for each person here, to evaluate where is your heart. Let the Lord speak to your heart. No man can judge that, but God knows. And if your heart needs an adjustment, let him. Let him fill you with his presence and adjust it. You see, the Pharisees, we're going to talk about them now. They had aspirations too. They weren't satisfied with the state of their country. They hated their country the way it was. They longed to throw off the bonds of the Romans and the Herodians and to see the powerful Messiah take over the country. They longed for this. To see a powerful Messiah rise and take up David's throne in power. To see a theocracy take place in their nation. The good old days of Israel. The Pharisees saw very little value for the government of man unless that government was running strictly according to their interpretation of the law of Moses. And the reason I say their interpretation is because not only did they go by the law of Moses, but they made up all kinds of rules and regulations in the Mishnah that also were something that they had to follow to the letter. They opposed these poll taxes being imposed on the Jewish people by Rome Result, resenting the rule of Rome over them. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government. That was their chief end. And they also wanted to overthrow Rome's puppet government of Herod, the Edomite. See? The Pharisees, when they asked Jesus about whether or not it was proper to pay taxes to Rome, they were in fact asking him to publicly weigh in on whether the, Jesus thought it proper for the Jews to be submitting to Roman authority. That was the question. It was deeper than just the Daenerys. They were asking Jesus whether he thought it was proper for them to be submitting to Roman authority. And the fact is, and this is ironic, that they were using a coin that was minted by Caesar, by the Roman government, as an illustration to Jesus The fact that they were pulled it out of their pockets when Jesus asked for a Daenerys indicates that they thought it was worth something. Otherwise, it wouldn't be with them. Now, I mean, they could have picked it off of someone else, I suppose, but I'm pretty sure all of them, the Herodians and the Pharisees, used Roman money to do exchange. Therefore, They're accepting Caesar's authority over them, or they wouldn't be using his money. But Jesus is also saying, don't forget that you were also created in the image of God, and as such, you must live under his authority as well. And during, I'm going to bring this down to a local level where we're all at, because that's the gospel and the the teachings of Christ are meant to be practical for us to, to operate under in everyday life, right? We all know that the pandemic of 2020 and 2021 was one of the worst times. It was horrible, right? It wasn't very fun. Who had fun during the pandemic? 
Say I. I, I don't hear any eyes. <laughs> yeah, it was a, ter- a, a hard time. A, a, as a church, our responsibility, we must say, is responsible to God. Right? We're responsible primarily to God. But that being said, it is very clear from a number of scriptures that under God, we are also called to submit to human government. Recognizing that it is in fact God who we submit to, who permits them to rule over us. And most of you are very much aware of the public stand I took during the pandemic on civil disobedience and submission to authority. I I could not get past what it says in Romans 13, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6, 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, and Titus 3, 1 to 2. I couldn't get past that. I had to stop and as a leader, remind you as people of God to be subject to the authority that God has placed over you. And sadly, unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, it's just sad. This has caused so much division in the church. We saw our own flock divided and pretty close to a third of our congregation left. It was, I can't express to you how broken inside I've been overseeing that. It just breaks my heart. You know, it's always true that along with some good decisions made, governments in power have made some very bad and unwise decisions, which quite frankly enrage us or should cause us deep concern. Our Canadian political system, our national, provincial, and municipal governments, you guys were all here when they decided to allow for a a large industrial marijuana grow grow operation to be at the back of our property here. That has never come to being, and prayerfully it never will, but they passed it and upheld the law that gives permission for what I consider to be something that is sinful. And I think a lot of you felt the same way. We went and we spoke at our, spoke very candidly and very respectfully at our city council meeting and they ruled against us. That's tragic. It's also tragic that I don't think everyone has been treated fairly under the rule of law during the pandemic. Maybe some would disagree, but I, I don't think it, there, there's been partisan behavior for sure. Additionally, I'm suspicious that there's legislation that violates the Constitution or creates loopholes to existent laws that we have. And admittedly, there's also some regulations and ordinances from the government that we have on a day-to-day basis that wind up as an inconvenience for me, for us. There's some laws out there that are really inconvenient. When they put a provincial or they put a region wide campfire ban in the back 40 and it's pouring rain that week, everything in me goes, I want to have a campfire. Right? Doesn't always line up. But then we see the forest fires and then you start to think, okay, well, there's reason behind this. But they have to make a line in the sand somewhere. We don't like being inconvenienced and told what to do when it seemingly violates our personal rights and freedoms, do we? None of us really relish that. But thankfully, after nearly five and a half decades of living, I have never had a law forced upon me requiring that I choose between God and man. I know others of you have based upon your consciences, and that's, you need to hold to your conscience before God. My friends, despite our feelings on political issues, we must understand that the Bible teaches us 
we must understand this, that God is very serious about us respecting and submitting to our governing authorities. He's very serious about it. Those scriptures, those passages that I quoted to you, it's not just a one-shot, out-of-context thing. This is multiple passages of the scripture that are pointing to the same direction. This is very important to God. What Jesus says in the scripture is that we should give back or render to Caesar, meaning that we need to pay a debt. We have a debt that we owe to pay back to Caesar. You see, Jesus makes it clear to the Herodians and the Pharisees that as citizens of their particular Caesar or governing authority, they owe a debt to that government in return for the services that they receive. We owe the same get debt to our Canadian authorities. Our government provides us with hospital services, fire protection, street lights and pavement and lines on the road, fire, police, ambulance services, national defense, the salaries of our public officials who manage our affairs, special programs for needy and handicapped people, a welfare system for those who, for whatever reason, can't get work. A pension plan for all seniors over the age of 65 when they retire. Thankfully, we're citizens of a free and democratic society, and unlike our fellow believers who are in Rome in the setting that Jesus was speaking in, we can make our wishes known through votes and with letters to our political representatives, expressing our feelings on issues, and we can sign petitions if we so choose. Jesus also says that not only do we have a debt to our Caesar, but we also have a debt to give to God that which belongs to God. It means that we have a context for that. And what is it? What is it that we owe to God? I would put it to you that we owe God everything. Absolutely everything. My health, my well being, my finances, everything, my job. My children, my family, everything, we owe a debt of gratitude to God because he has enabled us to have these things. In Romans chapter 13, 4 to 8, it is written, For the one in authority is God's servant. Stop there for a second. Who's it talking about? Any human authority that's placed in a position of trust over us. by They are God's servants for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit. Listen to this. It is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And this is why we pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. And it's going beyond just authorities here. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Is it easy to honor, to respect, and to pay tribute to a governing authority that we perceive is in the wrong, wasting our finances, or making rules and regulations that we don't like? No, it's not easy, but this is the scripture, my friends. This is what God is commanding us to do. And in verse 8, it says this, and this is the caveat of the whole thing. Let no debt remain outstanding 
If you owe debt to your governing authorities, whether it's respect and honor or finances, then pay it. Pay them respect. Pay them honor. This is, there's been such craziness in society over the pandemic days. We need to get back to the track and do what is right, not what we feel, but what the Word of God tells us. Because I don't feel like respecting certain authorities. I don't. They make me mad. I'll say right now, I'm not a big fan of our Prime Minister as far as what he does. That's me personally. Maybe you are. I don't know. And I'm not a huge fan of him. Nevertheless, he owes, I owe a debt of respect to him and owe a debt of honor to him because he has been placed in that position by God. He's a, God has permitted that. And maybe it's because of the hardness of our people's hearts that some officials get appointed that he gives them over to reprobate minds. Maybe that's true. But it's not our place to play God. We need to pray. What debt is outstanding? A debt of prayer before God to ask him to do something in the hearts and lives of our authorities. In proper context, in this particular passage that we're going over, the debt that we owe to God is simply to obey his word to obey his word in context, even if it bristles against our perceived notion of propriety. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us this. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for what? What is the scripture useful for? For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? Why? So that the servant of God, that's us, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants us to be salt and light out there, people. He doesn't want us to be in an armada against what he has permitted. He wants us to have an attitude of love and concern and care for even those that we disagree with that make us bristle. It applies to us, even if we don't like it. Ouch. Because I'm preaching to you guys, but I have the same attitude struggles that everyone does. Ouch. If we're truly intent on our hearts, trusting God with the Lord's prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we don't get to cherry pick what we like and what we don't like when God puts circumstances in front of us which are not to our liking. And this is what the Pharisees did, and that was their downfall. And it leads people into embracing false teaching, which which contorts the meaning of God's word out of its intended context to suit a fancy. Oh, people, we need to be true to the word of God and its context. And Jesus' intent when he answered the Pharisees and the Herodian was that we're to yield to God's sovereign will when it comes down to listening to our government. If we owe taxes, we pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And in all cases, we owe all men, even those whom we might disagree with, an ongoing debt of love. Patience, kindness, goodness. 1 Corinthians 13, God's description of that. It's written for us in his word. Uh, when we look at submission to the power of our Canadian Caesar, which is our democratically elected government as believers, and I believe that we do desire to honor God, he wants us to honor the leadership that he's provided for us, to pray for them. And we need to be careful to obey them in the areas where they're telling us to do something. If it's not against God's law, we need to say, yes, sir. That's what what Jesus is saying here. 
Render unto Caesar, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. God's placed that. Now we're a nation and province, I'm going to wrap up here. Provinces that are governed with parameters of Canadian constitution. Right? For example, our, our governing authorities, they saw fit to place restrictions on our gatherings over the past few years. And, and we were told that this was for the public good. Restrictions on venues, restrictions on numbers, restrictions which told us we need to cover our mouth and noses with an uncomfortable mask. And regardless of, of the truth of how effective these measures are in, in stopping this disease and, and protecting the public, we may even have viewed some of the restrictions as borderline discriminatory or outright unconstitutional. Constitutional challenges um, were made in the courts. And they're still being made in the courts over what, was, what had taken place over the last two years in the judicial courts. And that, my friends, is the appropriate place for these challenges to be made and to be argued. For the believer in Jesus, the proper challenge to something is not to be done through the court of public opinion, but is on our knees in prayer and doing what we can to be respectful where we can. You see, in asking questions about the propriety of civil disobedience, we cannot mix up this principle. Civil disobedience is not this. It's not we must obey the Constitution rather than men. It is we must obey God rather than men. As Christians, we are commanded to submit to laws that may be unconstitutional. Did you know that? Because not every government has a constitution. But we cannot and must not submit to laws that are unbiblical. End quote. We cannot. This requires that we, as people, be absolutely biblically persuaded in our response to our governing authorities. Now, the Pharisees and Herodians ingrained thoughts of what they thought the political landscape should look like. They had traditions that needed to be upheld. They treated these traditions as God's intended application of a law, but we see Jesus telling them that they were wrong. They were so convinced that they were right. When God in the flesh confronted them over with it, when God, God in the flesh, Jesus, when he confronted them over it, they wouldn't listen and they wanted him out of the picture because they wanted to do what they wanted to do because they were convinced that they were right and that Jesus was wrong. May it not be so with us. May we run away from attitudes of Herodian and Pharisaical attitudes. Now, the outcomes were not good for the Pharisees and the Herodians, were they? They tried to establish their own rules of a theocracy, saying that it was God that was directing them to do that, when in fact God was not directing them to do that. God was telling them to render, therefore, unto Caesar that which was Caesar's. They didn't do that, particularly the Pharisees. They, in the name of God, tried to overthrow the Romans. And it wasn't God's time that Rome would be overthrown in that place. And the result was that the Jewish people were exiled from the land of Israel. Their precious temple system that the Herodians were trying to protect so fiercely was absolutely laid to waste. It was destroyed. And when you go to Israel today, the land, the monuments, the, the, the ruins they're uncovering are from that era of AD 68 to AD 70. This is the result of men acting in the name of God in their flesh. When God, in fact, has not said do this, they do it in the name of God. 
May we not be in that position. May we humbly ask the Lord to make us a salt and a light in the decay and in the darkness in which we live. It's dark out there. Dark out there. It's decayed out there. Yes, Canada is not where it should be. It's not a Christian nation anymore. And we can't expect it to become one by forcing it. The only way that Canada is going to change is if God decides that he's going to change the way things are. And the only way that's going to happen is if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And even then, we may be ending up in a scenario of exile like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in because of the disobedience and the ungodliness of the people. We get swept along with it. Therefore, our responsibility is to be faithful to what God has said in his word and not to be part of the darkness, but to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. Amen.